Thank you, Patrick. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, ambassadors, uh, uh, current and, and former, <coughs> incumbent and in, uh, in previous, uh, along with other distinguished guests. Uh, we're pleased, proud, and honored to uh, be able to have a forum <coughs> on an issue as important as, as this one. Uh, one of the slides there focused on the youth and the number of Saudi Arabians uh, and uh, universities in the United States. By the way, there's a discrepancy between the numbers that people think uh, exist for American universities and colleges and, and the actual number. The actual number is 2,968 universities. So uh, leaving quality uh, aside, and one can see uh, that aspect alone of the appeal and attraction of America's uh, institutions of higher education and training and leadership development uh, for the emerging generation that will stand on the shoulders of the existing one and those that preceded uh, uh, the, uh, the previous ones uh, b before now. Uh, this particular uh, aspect of the challenge will be addressed uh, by uh, Dr. Paul Sullivan and uh, commented upon by Dr. Fahad Nazar, and then we'll have a macro uh, uh, focus uh, on the many different uh, variables and, and facets and uh, phenomena uh, that are relevant not just to Saudi Arabia's efforts to achieve the goals it has laid out in Vision 2030, but the American component uh, of it, uh, the United States has long had the most uh, privileged and beneficial and uh, uh, reciprocally rewarding uh, relationship with Saudi Arabia uh, uh, of any country among the 213 countries in the world and 193 uh, members of the United Nations. Uh, one would not always be aware of this uh, because uh, it is uh, a fact of life, uh, more than 60 years at least now, and counting, actually more than 70 years, almost 80 years for the special Saudi Arabian-U.S. relationship, that just about anything that Saudi Arabia does uh, neutral or positive in uh, regional or international global affairs uh, does not make it above the fold on the front page of any newspaper magazine in the United States or is the uh, tone and theme of any upbeat announcements and pronouncements on the evening news or larger commentary, even in documentaries. Uh, but for sure, anything that it does controversial, uh, negative, uh, that uh, may or may not have implications for uh, the world, for the region, uh, for the United States, for the Saudi Arabian people, that will be on page one above the fold. And the good news uh, uh, in today's message is, is a mixture. It's not all positive. It's not all negative. Uh, it has uh, a mixture of uh, the two. If you interpret negativity uh, to be synonymous with challenges or problems or, or difficulties, yes, of course, uh, they are all of, of the above. Uh, now, you, you have uh, not just the largest country in the uh, Arab uh, context or the Middle East context or the Islamic world uh, context, but you have a country that's almost to be likened to a continent. Uh, Americans uh, think that uh, the United States is big, and, and indeed it is. Um, and it has two fantastic, ra rather peaceful neighbors thus far in terms of the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, few countries, if any, could ask for a better, more accommodating and affable uh, neighbor uh, to the north than the United States has in Canada, America's uh, largest uh, trading partner. As well as with Mexico, uh, despite the negativity laced in various uh, nominees' uh, commentaries uh, in the run-up to the national presidential election or even the uh, nomination of, of the two parties here, with regard to Mexico, uh, uh, the United States abounds uh, with the mutuality of benefit uh, with our neighbor to the south. Uh, but for most Americans who think that the United States has but two neighbors, well, there's a former governor of, of Alaska who would 
have pointed out that, yes, uh, one can uh, wake up and look in, in a non-hazy day, see yet a third uh, neighbor in terms of the Soviet Union. And if you count in uh, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, uh, Cuba, and the Caribbean, uh, we have a handful uh, or more than a handful of additional neighbors. But ponder what would be the reality and the implications and the ramifications if the United States was like Saudi Arabia and had 13 neighbors in terms of its land and maritime and neighbors. Uh, if one can uh, try to be a clinical, detached, and objective by projecting oneself into the shoe soul situations of Saudi Arabians, uh, obviously, the reality of not just day-to-day -day life, but minute-to-minute -minute life, would be not just somewhat different, it would be profoundly different. Um, and here also is a country that uh, has, hasn't a single river, uh, not one perennially flowing stream or creek or brook or pool or pond or puddle there in terms of its water challenges there and the use of its energy to uh, power the desalination and, uh, and electricity uh, generating plants that also are dependent upon the kingdom's energy resources. People overlook that. They think of Saudi Arabia as a gigantic producer and exporter, and America's long relationship and dependency uh, upon the kingdom for this component of the relationship, but almost overlooked completely, even by some specialists, is the growing domestic internal demand for energy by the Saudi Arabian citizenry. It takes energy uh, to produce energy. I believe Saudi Aramco uh, itself uh, takes around 10% of the offtake of the uh, daily pr production of the kingdom's uh, hydrocarbon uh, fuels. Uh, so these are just a few of the introductory remarks here. Uh, but to, to, to provide a little bit more in the realm of contextual texture, uh, you have the regional and international and beyond global uh, circumstances in which the kingdom finds itself. Uh, within the last month, uh, you had a historic uh, visit uh, by uh, the President of the United States uh, to Riyadh and uh, historic unprecedented three summits back-to-back, uh, -back, uh, a, a U.S.-Saudi Arabian summit, uh, a U.S.-GCC uh, representatives uh, summit, and a U.S. summit with representatives of as many as 50 Muslim-majority uh, nations. And uh, this came uh, at a time when there is a travel ban on uh, citizens from uh, uh, seven uh, uh, Muslim uh, countries, that has been challenged by the American uh, court system, and those challenges have been upheld so far. You have another situation in Congress uh, with something called JASTA that can be unraveled from its acronyms, uh, but if it passes through both houses of Congress and is signed by the president and therefore is enacted into the law of the land, you have a situation that cha challenges sovereign immunity, such as has never been uh, challenged uh, before. And one may ponder, what does this mean? What might this mean in terms of the implications of those two phenomena uh, for Saudi Arabia's uh, ability and likelihood to achieve the goals outlined, laid out in its uh, Vision uh, 2030? And we'll come to grips with uh, why there is this articulated vision at this time, what have been the drivers of it there, and if it seems unrealistic, and I should think some in the audience may think it is unrealistic, then the euphemistic uh, response could be that uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with but a single step, and what's a heaven for if, if not uh, to exceed uh, a human being's reach in terms of aspiring to leave the world uh, a better place than that in which uh, one uh, found it. All of us here have these kinds of individual challenges. Those of us who are specialists have them collectively, and those who are foreign affairs practitioners more broadly uh, also uh, have this as a challenge. This is not just any relationship, and it is not any special relationship. This is a relationship for all of the negativity in the American media 
uh, that not just periodically but more or less constantly uh, targets the kingdom and its people and portrays them as objects, uh, not as actors, uh, portrays them as mountains of money, not as the heirs of a rich legacy of culture and civilization that has contributed mightily to other cultures, civilizations, and to humanity uh, as, as a whole. There are these dynamics that get trampled underfoot uh, to the degree that they're focused on and people are aware and appreciative of them at all. And then you have the current events dynamics uh, there of what uh, uh, appears to be the single greatest uh, crisis or uh, challenge to the uh, six-country uh, uh, Gulf Cooperation Council of Kuwait, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and Oman uh, in the history of this sub-regional organization to date when it was founded in May of 1981 with Saudi Arabia uh, being, uh, of course, the largest of the economy of the six, the uh, country with the uh, largest uh, armed forces establishment of any of the uh, six countries, uh, the country that has uh, almost all of its phone calls <laughs> returned from outside by people recognizing uh, the position, the role, and the importance of this uh, particular country uh, uh, amongst uh, the family of nations here. Uh, so this particular challenge must not be uh, underestimated. It has to do in the overall context of security. And without security, uh, people can do nothing. Just imagine yourself not having security today when you walk out of here and thinking um, I should be packing heat uh, there, um, or I'm not sure I can make it home, or I'm not, uh, uh, it's not guaranteed that I can make it to my office, or it's not certain that I will remain a father or a mother to my children or a spouse uh, to my husband or my wife. Imagine if this were your daily reality. It is for a number of people in the region. And this is a reality that Saudi Arabia has to uh, contend with uh, in terms of its uh, neighborhood. And it has to contend with the consequences of something uh, that the United States did in March of 2003, uh, the far-run results of which uh, have yet to be seen, uh, but altered dramatically the geopolitical, the geostrategic, and potentially uh, the uh, geoeconomic uh, dynamics and relationship of the region and its uh, relationship with the world uh, beyond. Uh, in this aspect, if you do not have security, you cannot have stability. And investors uh, are known to be cowards with regard to uh, not wanting to uh, put money in a place where uh, there is no certainty of security and stability. And not just over the weekend or even a period of weeks or even months, uh, but sustained over time, maintained over time, strengthened over time, expanded over time. And stability within, as the 2030 vision uh, emphasizes, is a core uh, challenge uh, for the kingdom's citizens and its partners, its friends, and its allies, its, its strategic uh, competitors uh, even, uh, but security and stability without in terms of the world beyond its borders. You have Yemen, uh, you have Iran, you have Iraq, uh, you have Syria, you have Lebanon, you have Libya, you have Palestine, uh, not ranking any of these in order of priorities, but imagine if you were in Riyadh as two of uh, their excellencies uh, sit and work on a daily basis to try to examine and analyze and assess what these kinds of challenges uh, mean. And, and of course, the uh, ruhaha pertaining to Qatar in the last uh, two weeks is one that uh, invites everyone's uh, attention and analysis and assessment of what does this mean not just for Saudi Arabia, uh, but for other members of the Gulf Cooperation Council. And because these are looking out for America's 
commercial, trade, and investment, and technology cooperation uh, interest. What does it mean for the United States that has its largest base, not in any of the GCC countries, but Qatar, in addition to naval facilities in Bahrain, and additional army and air facilities in Kuwait and uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, on top of an even longer standing access to facilities agreement with the Sultanate of Oman. Uh, what does this mean? Does the United States sit back and do nothing? If you say no, it must do something. What something uh, must the United States do other than lend its good offices and its diplomatic best hands to uh, support the mediation efforts of Kuwait and Oman uh, in, in the background uh, there? Uh, so these are no marginal matters uh, that we're focusing uh, on today. Uh, none of us have the answers to many of the questions posed. Uh, not one of us is bereft of blemish. Uh, who amongst us is uh, devoid of defect? Uh, hardly is one free from flaw. Uh, so uh, we'll benefit immensely by hearing from, learning from, obtaining knowledge and understanding from these three gentlemen to my left. But even more important for all of us is what they will learn, which each of us will learn from your questions. And so we're looking forward to those two. We'll, we'll start uh, with uh, Dr. Paul Sullivan. Uh, and I won't uh, go into any of the biographical details. They're on the materials that are uh, left on your chair when you came in. But uh, simply to say he's a longtime participant in the national dialogue between the United States and its strategic partners, uh, particularly on security and economic issues. And then he will be followed by Dr. Fahad Nazar, who's a distinguished international affairs fellow at the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations, as is Dr. Sullivan, uh, and who is also a a political uh, analyst uh, at the embassy of, of Saudi Arabia. Uh, but his remarks will have nothing to do with his uh, uh, official uh, uh, dynamics of his uh, professional uh, work. And then we will have uh, uh, Mr. Ed Burton, who is the senior, the doyen of all of America's uh, former uh, foreign commercial service uh, personnel in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the uh, CEO and Director of the uh, Saudi Arabia U.S. Uh, Business Council here in the uh, nation's capital uh, area. Um, we'll focus uh, first on the remarks of Dr. Paul Sullivan. Right, good morning. Salamu alaikum. Well, Ramadan Karim. Whenever I give a public speech, I have to give the following caveat. These opinions of mine alone do not represent those of the National Defense University, Georgetown University, Yale, or any other organization I might be associated with. Saudi Arabia's economy has been on a roller coaster. It's called the oil roller coaster. Whenever the prices of oil are high, they have the good years. And they invest a lot, and they spend a lot, and they develop a welfare system which is unsustainable in the long run. Because the oil prices necessarily fluctuate, and they do go down. And the most recent precipitous drop in oil prices caused extreme financial stress on some parts of Saudi Arabia. It's ridden the good times. It's also ridden the bad times. Also, the amount of uh, GDP in Saudi Arabia that's oil goes according to the price of oil. When the price of oil is low, it's lower, and other things take uh, the slack up. And when the oil prices are high, then it's quite high. Uh, certain times of uh, Saudi Arabian history, revenue is both for the government and for exports, or 90 and even 90-plus from oil. 
Now they're down to 75%, and the Saudis are looking for other revenue sources. There are real no income taxes in Saudi Arabia, thankfully for the Saudi Arabians. A VAT tax is being considered, which could actually increase inflation and increase unemployment, but that's another issue, but it's a way to get revenue. Also, corporate taxes are extremely low in Saudi Arabia. Those corporate taxes may have to come up in order to balance the budget because the Saudis are looking at some very difficult budgetary times. This is the roller coaster. How many of you would run a, run a company that was on a roller coaster like this and make long-term decisions? This is what's driving Saudi 2030 and the National Transition Plan for 2020. His Excellency Mohammed bin Salman and others involved with this, including the king, realize that this is not sustainable. And it's also not sustainable with a population growth rate of 2.4% and, I'll point out later, an unemployment rate of the youth at around 45% in certain age brackets. This simply cannot continue. The government knows that, and it has to move forward. Taking a look at the oil production as part of GDP, look at that roller coaster. Another roller coaster, the contribution to GDP. Roller coaster, roller coaster. You either are borrowing money or you're lending money. Something has to change. And that something will change, hopefully. The Saudi real GDP forecast has been declined. During 2013, 2014, they were doing very well because the price of oil was going up since about 2008. When the price of oil dropped, the GDP dropped. Everything else collapsed with it. The fiscal balance for Saudi Arabia is also very much in the negative because of these revenues that were lost due to the drop in the oil prices. They also continue to spend a lot of money on various projects, but subsidies have been reduced. Uh, the price of petrol has actually gone up from 16 cents equivalent to 24 cents equivalent. For the Americans in the room, that's like, wow, let's go for a road trip in Saudi Arabia. This is awesome. But for Saudis, it was a shock. Also, I know from some of my Saudi military friends that their incomes have been dropped, for some of them, as much as 20 to 25 percent. A lot of the welfare programs have been dropped. This could cause social instability. This roller coaster is an impetus for future uh, social instability. There's a pool of young men and women, look at this, about 60% of the people in Saudi Arabia are under the age of 30. There's a youth bulge coming in the employment of Saudi Arabians that Saudi Arabia is not ready for yet. Also, for male Saudi Arabians, about 50% of them do not graduate college. And the education system is not necessarily directly related to the economy. Many things have to change. Again, the Saudis know this. Underemployment, some of you are not economists, means that you graduated from university, had a good degree, had high grades, and you're either doing nothing, that's unemployment, or doing something well below what you should be doing, that's underemployment, and that's clearly a social and security issue. You don't want a lot of smart kids and young adults with an engineering background running around causing havoc because they're unemployed and unhappy. Right now, these are the unemployment rates that we're talking about. 15 to 25 years old, you're talking 43%. In another bracket, 35% unemployment rates. Think back to when you were 18 to 25 years old and think back to what you might have felt like if you had no job. No job. And there is poverty in Saudi Arabia. There is a middle class. Not everyone is rolling in gold, like uh, John Duke pointed out. If you travel around Saudi Arabia, you will see the unemployed. And you may see them riding in cars like this with two wheels. They have a lot of time on their hands. And time on the hands with a lot of energetic youth is not a good thing. The kingdom's leaders acknowledge this issue. They know the problems are there. This is the solution that they're looking at. This is His Excellency Mohammed bin Salman. 
the deputy crown prince. It's more than just economics here. It's uh, strengthening the identity of the country and their people. Uh, privatization has a lot to do with this. They want to move a lot of stuff from the government into the private sector. A develop a financial sector that's uh, more forthcoming, more transparent. And I'll be talking a bit about the housing market. There's been a lot of bumpy starts in the housing market with regard to finances. The mortgage system in Saudi Arabia is not exactly well developed. It's a rather small amount of the houses being purchased. And some odd things happened in 2014, which required the average Saudi to put 30% down on a house. Well, if you're a prince, that's not a problem. But if you're a pauper, that's a problem. And if you don't have a house, that's a security issue, along with not having a job. And this is what main focus is of a lot of this stuff. Uh, partnerships with other countries. This was Trump's visit and other visits that will be happening. I'm not exactly sure what the end results of Trump's visit might be with regard to all these investments that were MOUs, not actually signed contracts. These things take time. And also, there are MOUs within the United States, that strategic partnership. This is what they're looking at. It's very ambitious, extremely ambitious. The first time I looked at this, I just kind of stood up from my chair and said, what? What is the year we have this introduced, 2016? 2020, which is the National Transmission, uh, Transition Program, uh, ends uh, in the next uh, four years. 2030 is in 13 years. But there is something auspicious in 2030, which may point to the possibility of most of this getting done. My guess is 60% might get done, 50% might get done. There will be two Ramadans in 2030, which is really quite interesting. So maybe there's a miracle along the way here that may allow this to happen. But look at what they want. The labor market, bring more women into the labor market, drop the unemployment rate. That's the average unemployment rate. The real effect of unemployment rates, you have to look at the bands of ages and also look at how many younger people are coming in and how many jobs need to be produced. We're talking about millions of jobs that need to be produced going towards 2030. And the question is, how are they going to do that? They want to increase non-oil trade to get off that royal co roller coaster. They want to get their fiscal house in order. They want to get rid of all of these subsidies. But when you get rid of subsidies, not all of them, when you get rid of them too quickly, you have instability in your country. If you get rid of them in the wrong way, you can have instability in your country. An example of that is getting rid of the bread subsidy in Egypt, which was imposed upon them by the IMF in 1977. They burned down part of Cairo and part of Alexandria. The Egyptians, being very clever, took the subsidies off and actually did it their way, which is what maybe should have been done in the first place. They reduced the size of the bread and didn't change the price, and nobody noticed. There are all different ways of making this stuff happen. If you do it in a shocking way with a lot of angry young people, this is not the way to do it. Private sector, they want to develop the private sector. Most Saudis work in the government which means the government roles have huge payroll accounts. Part of 2030 is to move Saudis into the private sector. Most of the people in the private sector today are low-skilled expats from Asia and the Middle East. This is part of the project also. Move Saudis into middle-income jobs in the private sector, have more investment in the private sector, pro most likely in SMEs, small to medium enterprises, so the government doesn't have to have the sinecures and the wage rolls that is crushing the budget when the oil prices go down. Of course, increase foreign direct investment. And that would, of course, also mean you have to have better investment laws and rule of law and protection of property. And they're working on that as well. FDI could be massive in Saudi Arabia. This is a country of huge potential. Huge potential. And not just because of oil, but because of its people, its region, and where they want to go. Another part of this is tourism, which can be socially dicey, but I think uh, the, another fellow is going to be talking about this. He, bringing in a lot of Western tourists to Saudi Arabia in a fast moment without getting control over 
what kind of tourists you're going to have is simply not going to work. I saw that in Egypt and even in Jordan, uh, let's say when some of the Russians and others came in and behaved inappropriately. This cannot occur in Saudi Arabia and actually have tourism moving forward. Go to Sharm el-Sheikh these days. It is not what it was when I first landed there when there was a small lobster restaurant and one tiny hotel and all Egyptians acting like Egyptians. Healthcare, they want to be one of the top in the world. Oil and gas, they want to increase downstream, not upstream investments. And that would entail not just in Saudi Arabia, but outside of Saudi Arabia. This is a way of grasping the value added of oil. If you're just exporting crude oil, you're exporting crude oil. If you're exporting petroleum products and plastics and ethylenes and all that other stuff, you grasp that value added and you give your country more wealth and also you can give your country more potential for employment. Education, huge issue in Saudi Arabia. A lot of people are educated but not for the market. They want to have their own military industry. This is not going to be easy. They're pretty much starting from scratch. And that will take education and training and a lot of expats to help them along the way. But there is a possibility. The Saudis are also looking to develop an automobile industry, which I think is a bit of a reach right now. But automobile parts would not be a reach. Step by step, the hare and the tortoise, who won the race? The tortoise. Going too quickly can actually shatter an economy. An example of this is the Shah of Iran in 1976, saying we want to be the fifth largest economy in the world right beside Italy. He shattered the economy and he shattered the society. I implore the Saudi to be careful on moving too quickly because your society is a traditional one. It may look good with the macro numbers, but if your society shatters because of too much change, You're looking at 1978-79 Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran. I do not want Saudi Arabia to go into turmoil. It's a wonderful country. It's the center of Islam. It is a country of great history, as John Duke pointed out. What we need is a stable Saudi Arabia in an unstable region. And this Qatar problem could really develop into something much worse than what we're seeing right now. Housing I'll get into later. Productivity, of course, can be improved, particularly when a lot of people are not producing at all or not working in productive industry. This is a big thing, and I'm going to be very blunt. This is me. I call it as I see it. I speak truth to power as much as I can, which explains probably why I'm not a senator right now. (laughs) Another part of this is immigration policy and giving people a permanent residency in order to establish SMEs and other things. And also Aramco, huge company. The actual uh, valuation of Aramco could be anywhere from $3 trillion to $13 trillion. Nobody really knows. And I think once the assets are calculated and it becomes transparent, which is part of the problem with the IPO, if you're going to have an IPO in New York or Singapore or Paris, you need transparency. And Aramco actually is not as transparent as it may need to be for that IPO to happen. But the IPO may actually bring in about $150 billion or $135. We're not sure. That's a lot of money. They're going to transfer that into a public investment fund, which will be transferred into a sovereign wealth fund. That sovereign wealth fund will be the largest sovereign wealth fund on the planet if it's done properly. And if that sovereign wealth fund is put into the right things, Saudi Arabia can move out and become a developing, stable, growing, highly educated, even wealthier economy with less inequality. Housing, big issue. Nice villa, but a lot of Saudis can't afford a villa. That's one thing that maybe a lot of Americans don't think about. When I moved to Egypt, one of my uh, colleagues from my previous job before moving asked me, do all Egyptians have oil wells beside their houses? I said, are you kidding me? No. The perception of Saudi Arabia is very different from the actuality of Saudi Arabia. Go there. Visit it. Meet the people. You'd be amazed, those of you who have not. 
there's a shortage of housing. Now, this is a wealthy country, so how could a wealthy country have a shortage of housing? Obviously, population is growing 2.4%. A lot of younger people are going to be moving out of their families' houses, which is different from what happens here. Here, when you're 18, you're pretty much you're on your own. Well, it used to be that way until the Great Recession, and now once you're 18, you come back from college and you're in your parents' garage until the year 2030. But this is changing, too. Uh, it's a social and a security issue. It's a waiting list for 1.5 million houses. Now, doesn't that sound like an investment opportunity to some of the people in this building, in this room? There are other investment opportunities. Part of the problem with this, particularly after a new mortgage law in 2014, is a lot of Saudis are renting. That's an unstable situation. And also to rent a house or an apartment in a culture such as Saudi Arabia's is in a way not comfortable. Having your own home and your own land is the way to comfort, but it's also a way to have a stable family, which means a stable country. That's the bottom line. You need to have a stable population to have a stable country. This is pretty much what the NTP is looking at, to go from 47% owning their homes to 52%. Back in 1973, 70% of Saudis owned their homes. That's been in decline because of the increase in the price of housing, but also the increase in the population of Saudi Arabia. Since 1967, the Saudi Arabian population grew 333%. 333%. How do you have housing for that? It becomes quite difficult. To give an indication of how important housing is for the whole plan, it gets most of the money. Take way to the left. Housing and then tourism is way down, water and electricity, and you get way over to the end, you get the civil service and the others. Housing is a big issue because family is a big issue in Saudi Arabia. With the right housing, you have the right stability. 2014, a new mortgage law started because the Saudis were afraid of financial instability, such as what happened in the United States in 2008. Massive amounts of mortgage loans were floating around and, and other loans. Usually there are third and fourth party uh, loans going out. You can go to many different people to get these loans and co-sign co and so forth. The Saudi government was afraid of what's going to happen with financial stability, so they put the leverage to value at 70%, which means if you've ever tried to buy a house, you have to put 30% down. How many of you could put 30% down for a brand new 4,000 square foot house in Great Falls, Virginia? I can hear the laughs. Now, if you're someone who's not making a lot of money in Saudi Arabia, and there are a lot of people who are not making a lot of money, will you get that 30%? No, you will not. You will rent you will be unhappy. You will be in a hovel somewhere. And the Saudis don't want that. So there we have it. This is the kind of money that they had to put down. The 2014 mortgage law, which had the 30% LTV, also happened at the time period when the price of oil collapsed. That's a bad combination. So the Saudis have created a vehicle where that 30% down has actually helped with the real estate development fund and other credit institutions that are just developing. The private mortgage markets are pretty thin. So the actual backup to the mortgage market and backup to the 30% is a government fund that is backed up by the Ministry of Finance. Everyone fall? It gets pretty complicated. But it's also quite interesting. Now, for affordable homes, you really can't go to that instrument that I was talking about, that I think backed up by the Ministry of Finance. You have to go to special loans through an organization called ESCAN, which gives loans to the lower income people. In other words, the Saudis realized that that LTV of 30% really harmed the market. The prices collapsed, less people could own homes, so let's fill that in with this gap. So the development fund is now going to become a bank, which allows it to do a lot of different kinds of mortgages. It'll work with the private sector. Another aspect of this is in the Middle East, and for Americans this sounds odd, except if you're extremely wealthy, a lot of people in the Arab world like to own vacant land. Why is that? 
<coughs> because it's a sign of wealth. They don't use it, many of them. This has kept the price of housing and the price of land higher than it otherwise would be. This will give you a sense of the vacant lands. This is in Riyadh. We're talking 85% of the possible land in Riyadh is vacant. And in Najran, Hail, and so forth, look at the numbers. That's, that's pretty extreme. So what the Saudis have done is have a white land tax of 2.5% on unused land. And if you don't use it, you keep on getting taxed. This would give people the incentive to use that land and essentially open up the land to build more houses and give more space for even the affordable housing. Another aspect of this is real estate investment trusts. When I think back to 2008 and I hear real estate investment trust, I cringe. But the real estate investment trust can open up huge capital markets for the Saudis to invest in real estate if it's done properly with the proper regulations and the proper backup. Right now they're looking at what a qualified investor institution is some group that has at least $5 million in pocket. This is not anyone who can get involved in a real estate investment trust. They're also going to be allowing foreign rights into the country. So that will diversify investment. It will stimulate the development of the vacant <coughs> land. And that's part of the NTP targets. It's kind of brilliant in a way. In uh, the Oxford Business uh, uh, Review uh, booklet on Saudi Arabia for 2016. There's a nice uh, uh, interview of the Minister of Housing, and he's talking about how the foreign companies can get involved in the demand side by helping out in mortgages, refinance, and other aspects of financing the development of land and construction. It uh, can also get involved in the supply side, meaning construction companies can, from the United States can get involved in housing markets in Saudi Arabia. But do be warned, the Koreans and the Chinese are already there, and they're moving so quickly, it's really hard to tell where this is coming from. But clearly, the skills that may be in this room in investment in housing and banking and so forth could be put into play, and it could be quite helpful. Also, the buying of bonds, including Sukuk bonds, Islamic bonds. Uh, those of you who don't understand what those are, essentially there cannot be riba or interest, uh, but there is a way to make money from this. But you just can't know about it until you make it. That's pretty much the simplified version of a Sukuk bond. It's a lot more complicated than that. But also, bonds in Saudi Arabia could be a huge market. And I'm being told to stop. So I will stop and I will answer further questions. And how about that? I finished it. <laughs> Super. Great. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anthony, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure and an honor um, to take part in the uh, National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations, many important events, and obviously today is no, no exception. So I, I would like to preface my remarks um, this morning uh, by making it very clear that uh, the views I express today are strictly my own. I do not represent the uh, views of the uh, Saudi embassy or the Saudi government in any way. Um, so I just wanted to uh, to make that clear. Um, by the way, uh, Dr. Sullivan, what you said about uh, 20, 2030 having two Ramadans is, is something that I'll have to uh, think about for the foreseeable future. I, I wasn't aware of that, but it's an yeah, interesting I, tidbit for sure. January 6th and December 26th so far, but that changes as we all know. Well, okay, I'll keep that in mind. Um, so um, as I look around the room, um, I think it's fair to assume that most of us are not old enough to remember the presidency of um, President um, John F. Kennedy. Uh, however, most of us, I think, are well aware of the, uh, his, his uh, memorable inaugura inaugural address. And uh, one particular line that stood out for uh, most historians and, and Americans, for sure, 
is the one where he challenged the Americans uh, by saying, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Um, I think in some ways the uh, unveiling of Vision 2030 in Saudi Arabia last year was an equally seminal moment in the history of Saudi Arabia. Um, the Vision 2030 is actually a document that is easily accessible online and uh, have it with me here. It's about 80 pages, but quite a few graphs. It's a good, easy read. Um, it's very carefully worded. Um, but uh, I think it becomes very clear. One does not have to read too much into the document to realize that this is not simply um, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, um, short-term austerity measures to come to grips with the, with the drop in oil prices, that this is clearly uh, a vision for the, uh, for the uh, long-term future of the, uh, of the kingdom. Um, <clears throat> so as, as, as you read on uh, very early in, uh, in the document, you come across phrases like improving the quality of life. Um, this document, in some ways, the way I see it, is a recalibration of the social contract in Saudi Arabia. Um, to use a term that we see in sports, it's almost a restructured uh, restructuring of, of the contract. It puts the um, Saudi people, Saudi individuals, the Saudi citizen front and center. Um, I think it makes it very clear that for the vision to succeed, each individual Saudi man and woman has to play uh, an important role. Uh, and that this is actually a collective effort. It's a collective endef endeavor, and everybody must play their role. Um, I don't think this is unreasonable, uh, especially in light of the, as Dr. Sullivan has said, I think there's a wide consensus in Saudi Arabia that the economic model um, that has been in place for, for a few decades at this point is simply not sustainable. Saudi Arabia has a population of 30 million, uh, 20 million of whom are citizens, and uh, that model is just not sustainable, especially at, uh, as you look at the structural changes to the uh, oil markets. Uh, the, the price of oil has become more and more difficult to control, and with the advent of um, technological innovation uh, regarding, in terms of uh, shale oil, I think, shale oil, I think it, it will be even more difficult to control uh, for the foreseeable future. So I think... Um, this is, this is a, a wise move. It's, uh, the uh, measures that are in it have been discussed for many years. Um, so, so as I said, um, again, if you read the vision, you will come across many references to, uh, to the, the fact that the key will be the Saudi people themselves. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Sullivan spoke about privatization, but th there's more to it than that. Um, so there are a number of projects that are currently underway. The Riyadh Metro is one of them. There's a, a train uh, from Mecca to Medina that will open uh, next year. Um, these and many other projects, at the heart of it, are the, basically, I mean, the ultimate objective is to improve the quality of life of, of Saudis. And I think there's a realization <laughs> among the Saudi leadership that that has to be the, the key um, moving forward. And now there's a number of pillars to, uh, to the vision. And uh, you see these terms repeated over and over again, uh, including transparency, accountability, and efficiency, all of which I think are obviously very important um, values. So as the vision itself was, was being uh, debated, uh, there was a number of workshops that were held that brought people, Saudis, from, from various sectors, from academia, from the business sector, to actually provide feedback as, as uh, this thing was being put together. Um, and this is one, uh, there's a number of institutions um, that basically have, have brought in the, the, the space available for Saudis to uh, where they're going to play. And I, I anticipate that this will be the case in the future going forward, that there will be the political space available for Saudis worldwide. And so they will have more of a say in the political uh, and economic decision-making process. Um, and, and this, I think, brings me to, to a point that is related to... Uh, to the vision, and, and obviously we speak about this economic transformation that Saudi Arabia is undergoing, but I've argued over the past few years that there's an even, uh, perhaps a, a more gradual, slower uh, transformation that Saudi Arabia has been undergoing for the past two decades, and that's a transformation in the uh, political culture of the country. 
I think if we look at a number of institutions that have been established, uh, I think beginning in the early 1990s, um, Saudi Arabia has become uh, more open, more transparent, uh, more inclusive of its diversity, and all of these are, are I think, great developments. Uh, as Dr. Sullivan uh, advised Americans uh, to go visit, um, I'm struck by, when I do speak to my American friends, uh, they all almost uh, say the same thing whenever they visit. And, and a number of prominent Americans have actually not only visited Saudi Arabia recently, but they've even written about their experience. I'm thinking here about Ambassadors Dennis Ross, uh, Zalmay Khalil Zad, and um, the uh, journalist Thomas Friedman. Uh, they've all written about their recent trips to Saudi Arabia, and they all came back. They were all left with the same impression, that the kingdom is really changing in major ways and changing for the better. Um, so when I, when I cite some of these institutions that, uh, again, um, this brings me, as, as a political scientist or somebody who's studied political science uh, for most of my adult life, one of the, the more lively debates in political science is that which debates the importance of um, political as opposed to economic reforms, uh, which should come first, uh, should you have them both together. Um, and, and I think that debate is going on in, in Saudi Arabia, and I think we're getting uh, both uh, economic, social, and, and uh, political reforms all at once. So there are a number of institutions that I think will play a major role in, in helping this vision succeed, and I am very hopeful um, that the vision will succeed. I think there will be challenges, and uh, if you listen to Saudi leadership, including His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman, he's been very frank in speaking about the vision and that there will be uh, some short-term term obstacles and challenges, but in the, in the long term, I think this will benefit everybody in the country, and I, I truly believe that will be the case. Um, but there are a number of institutions that I think uh, that don't get enough coverage in... Um, and the West in general, um, but I think they're reflective of, of the changes in Saudi Arabia. They're reflective of the changes in, in the political culture of the country. Um, and frankly, I mean, the uh, conventional wisdom in Washington, D.C. has always been that Saudi Arabia and the United States share a number of economic, political, um, security interests, but they don't have any values in common. Um, I think that assessment is, is in dire need of... of um, of a re-evaluation. Re I don't think that's the case. Uh, like I said, I think there's a number of institutions that have been established in Saudi Arabia that have made the country more inclusive, more open. Um, the, the way the government functions has become much more transparent than it has in the fact, and we see this with the unveiling of the Vision 2030. Uh, a number of press conferences were held uh, in the leading up to the announcement, and certainly since then, a number of ministers have held uh, press conferences uh, to to basically uh, prepare Saudi citizens for what's to come and to explain exactly what the vision is. You see infographics on social media. Uh, the Saudi media has covered it uh, on a daily basis. Um, so one of the institutions that I do want to highlight is, is the Shura Council. And I, I think if you look at the Shura Council over the past 20 years, um, it has evolved into um, a, a very serious deliberative body for sure that now has ministers from um, from all sectors of, of the the economy and beyond to um, to essentially hold hearings and to be held to account as to the performance of their ministries and to to say exactly how they will co contribute to the to the vision and and more broadly to Saudi society and the economy. Um, the Shura Council began with 60 members and now has 150 members, including 30 women. Every region of Saudi Arabia is represented. Um, there's even a, a number, I believe, eight or nine uh, members from the uh, minority Shia community. Um, and these are all, I think, positive developments that, again, I, I think in some ways don't get enough uh, coverage in, um, you know, in the Western press. Um, another institution that I was actually very lucky to visit last year was the, uh, um, the King Abdulaziz uh, Center for National Dialogue. This is a, a center that was established in 2003, and um, this center holds uh, periodically big events that bring Saudis from uh, different ends of the political and religious spectrum to discuss all the various uh, political, economic, and social challenges that are f confronting Saudi Arabia, which incidentally are uh, not challenges. Uh, they're challenges that every country in the world confronts. So things like education reform, health care reforms, housing, all of these issues have come 
uh, have been ad ad addressed and discussed in these debates and beyond. Um, again, I think this is a great uh, thing that is happening in Saudi Arabia, that there's a very lively public discourse that some of it is taking place in some of these institutions. Uh, a lot of it is taking place in the media, frankly. Uh, the media has transformed completely uh, over the past uh, 20 years. The scope of the uh, issues that are discussed has broadened uh, almost exponentially. Uh, again, I think these are very positive um, developments. And um, I, again, as President and uh, as uh, Dr. Sullivan said, um, education reform, uh, housing reform, health care, all of these issues are um, being debated in, in, in government, outside of government, in the media, on social media. Social media has really, I think, broadened the, uh, the space available to Saudis, and, and uh, it's my understanding, according to the latest statistics, that Saudis uh, use YouTube, uh, Twitter, and other social media more than any of their counterparts around the world. Uh, and again, I think that's a good thing. I think it has put some Saudi officials on notice, frankly, uh, and this message of efficiency, accountability, is coming straight from the top. Um, a number of you know mid mid level Saudi officials have been um, have had some just to, to cite as an example of of how things have changed in Saudi Arabia have had some public um, you know spats with with the regular Saudi citizens and um, they heard about them and, and some of them actually lost their positions. So I think. Um, these are just some of the changes that the, the kingdom is undergoing. And again, I obviously I think there are many cha uh, challenges up ahead. Um, but overall, I, I do I am very hopeful. Again, as Dr. Sullivan has said, the population of Saudi Arabia uh, is overwhelmingly young. Um, it is uh, there's a lot of excitement, certainly among Saudis, young Saudis that I speak to. Um, in some ways, uh, His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman, I think, embodies uh, the new Saudi Arabia with his youth, with his energy. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, Prince Mohammed uh, doesn't seem to, to care much for uh, formality. He adopts a very frank, he's adopted a very frank tone in his interviews. And I, um, he's given two very lengthy interviews, one to Al Arabiya, and I believe the other one to, was to NBC. And again, I strongly recommend that you watch those because he speaks... Um, in great detail about the various components of the vision. Uh, it's very clear that he and, and, and people around him have given this a lot of thought. And again, I think a lot of the programs have been discussed for years, but um, you know, Prince Mohammed and, uh, and his deputies are very serious about this. Um, they're implementing it. I think there will be uh, perhaps mistakes and challenges and bumps along the road, but I'm very hopeful for the future. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Ed Burton. I'm president and CEO of the U.S. Saudi Arabian Business Council. I want to offer my thanks to uh, you, John, uh, for the invitation to be with you this morning. Also, Pat, thank you for working with uh, our staff, as you have over the years, uh, to bring to the fore uh, the importance of the Saudi market. Uh, I have a PowerPoint. And I have about 20 minutes to get through them, about eight, 18 slides about a, a minute a slide, but I do want to preference, uh, preference my, uh, my comments with a, uh, my PowerPoint with a couple comments. First, uh, acknowledging the presence of uh, His Excellency Deputy Minister Abdurrahman Al Harbi. Uh, thank you for being here along with uh, other officials from uh, the, the Saudi government, the Royal Saudi Embassy here in Washington, and officials from the consulates uh, in New York uh, and elsewhere. I think it speaks to the commitment. Uh, that the government has to the U.S. market, uh, having him here. Ambassador, it's good to see you here as well. Um, you know, I, we at the Business Council were paid to be bullish on the Saudi market. So yeah. <laughs> my, my comments, you'll see, uh, range uh, with a, a lot of optimism. But, you know, I, I've seen it firsthand. I've seen it up close, having served in the kingdom as commercial attaché for a few years in 2003 and 2006. And those were some very difficult years. I mean, I, I remember almost midnight, uh, my, my windows of my place shaking 
uh, from the the bombing at Alhambra uh, complex. I you know I was I was duty officer at the embassy when Paul Johnson was uh, uh, kidnapped in that horrible uh, murder of of uh, that day uh, later. Uh, you know I've I've I was there when the Jeddah U.S. consulate uh, was overran by terrorists. And those were some very dark days, also in the economic relationship between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. Many companies, and I made the comment last night at the U.S. Chamber, uh, pulled back. Uh, many of them sent their senior executives to Doha, Manama, uh, Dubai, uh, and addressed the Saudi market from those, uh, those locales. Uh, it, it's a different day uh, today, and, and we see it. We see the level of enthusiasm uh, with uh, the Saudi market from many, many uh, quarters in the Saudi and the U.S. business community in terms of partnering together uh, to, to make profit in, in that market. Uh, I absolutely uh, detest people who name drop, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Uh, I, I was uh, privileged to be at Al-Yamama Palace when uh, President Trump was there visiting uh, His Majesty uh, King Salman bin Abdul Aziz Al Saud. I was in the room uh, with those uh, memorandums. Some of them actually were deals. Uh, they weren't all memorandum. Uh, and actually, we had a couple of actual deals signed at a, uh, a lunch that we hosted for Secretary Wilbur Ross separately from, from that summit. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, oh, I'm able to do that. Okay. So I'll name drop. I mean, being in a room with uh, Jamie Dimon and uh, Marilyn Houston and ha having a conversation with Jim Gorman from, uh, from uh, Morgan Stanley and uh, uh, you know, Henry Kravitz and David Rubenstein. I mean, I have – there's only a, a, one other occasion that I've seen so many Fortune 500 chairmen and CEOs in one room, and that was during the, the visit of uh, King Salman in September of 2015. Uh, and And – when you see that many chairmen and CEOs there uh, and you know what went on before and you hear some of the conversations uh, during the deal signing and, of course, at lunch, at some of the, the luncheon tables, uh, it is definitely a different day. The level of enthusiasm that uh, American business have uh, has for the Saudi market has not been seen since the early boom years of uh, of. Uh, the oil industry in, in the late 70s. So uh, when we look at uh, Vision 2030 and we see the commitment from uh, the level of commitment from U.S. corporations, uh, I think there is uh, great optimism. And you can see here uh, Jamie Dimon and, of course, the president and King Salman as well as Marilyn there. Um, So you've heard about uh, Vision 2030. Uh, many of the deals, if not most, were geared, uh, and the agreement signed, were geared towards bolstering the Saudi government's attempts to restructure its economy. Uh, Vision 2030, just generally uh, a methodology and roadmap uh, to make sure that economic development carries a pace uh, and that sustainable economic growth is achieved. And, of course, uh, as was previously indicated, it identifies general directions, policy, and objectives. Of course, the Council of uh, Economic and Development Affairs, chaired by uh, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, carries on the work. Uh, and there are a number of bodies within Vision 2030 to make sure that uh, the, uh, the plan, uh, uh, the economic vision, and the National Transformation Plan uh, is executed. And most importantly, I think, for U.S. business, the government is committed to transparency. And there is a National Center for Performance Management, which is entrusted uh, in promoting transparency and, uh, transparency and the execution of this plan. The proposed uh, programs under Vision 2030, government restructuring, it accelerates government decision-making to increase efficiency, uh, establishes two councils to oversee government strategies, there is uh, uh, analysts foresee the potentials for privatization as, as very high in the areas of uh, medical health care in terms of hospitals, water utilities. Uh, they're looking at grain silo pro uh, privatization 
as well as uh, the uh, ma management of uh, roads. The public investment fund restructuring uh, is a major development uh, which will be bolstered as uh, previously uh, commented on by the 5% uh, privatization of Saudi Aramco, which will inject extreme liquidity in, into Saudi Arabia uh, and allow it to extend its, its investments globally. Uh, the strategic partnerships enhance Saudi Arabia's links with nations worldwide and increase exports. So there are uh, a number of organizations, such as the Strategic Partnership Office, of course, His Excellency is uh, here, representing the Ministry of Commerce and other entities that are on the lookout, not just in the United States, but globally, for appropriate investment vehicles for Saudi capital. On just some of the major highlights, so we talked about the, the IPO coming up, the expanded role of uh, the PIF. Uh, in terms of health care, which I will highlight a little later, along with infrastructure, uh, they, the plan calls for raising total private sector contribution in the health care sector from 25 to 35 percent by 2020, increasing the contribution of local pharmaceutical manufacturing, and there have already been a number of investments by U.S. pharmaceuticals, from 20 percent to 40 percent by 2020, uh, and just optimizing uh, and better utilizing the capacity of public hospitals uh, and health care centers. And, and, you know, they say a, a large measure of a nation is how it takes care of its people. Uh, and the amount of care and attention that the, the government is uh, paying to the health care sector speaks volumes in that regard. Uh, infrastructure objectives, and I'll highlight uh, that with a few slides later, they want to increase private sector investment opportunities for private participation, uh, as I indicated, uh, in transportation in terms of uh, airport, rail, ports, uh, and, of course, uh, road infrastructure. Residential buildings, it's uh, been uh, commented on that there is a, uh, a lack of housing. Uh, the Ministry of uh, Housing has a number of programs uh, to 187, actually, affordable housing projects going on that will provide over 233,000 homes in the near term. Again, with uh, 1.5 million in, in uh, deficit, uh, they have a long way to go, but uh, they are acting. Uh, increasing demand for services. There is a demographic uh, reason why um, there is a demand for services across the board. Uh, the population, Saudi population, age 65 and over, is proje projected to increase from 3.6 percent to 7.7 percent of the total population by 2030. Uh, and relatedly, the demand for health care services is projected to increase 36 percent by 2030. And you can uh, see that by the sort of purplish middle line there on the graph. A growing strain, of course, uh, with this new population uh, will create a, a, a need to update transportation infrastructure, opening uh, opportunities for uh, U.S. companies uh, in that sector. The demand for transport sector is projected to increase 38 percent, 38.3 percent by the year 2030. Uh, and as was indicated, the shortage of affordable housing is an ongoing issue, uh, and residential housing demand is expected to grow by 44.5 percent by 2030. Healthcare. I just want to highlight a, a few sectors here uh, as I uh, enter the sort of the middle part of my uh, presentation. Healthcare is one of the most uh, uh, important sectors uh, that uh, is both budgeted for uh, and administered uh, by the Saudi government. Uh, it is viewed as a high source of uh, high skilled labor and high wage jobs. Uh, the sector uh, seeks to address, uh, or the government's attention to the sector seeks to address widespread health issues like obesity and health disease. Unfortunately, uh, Saudis suffer from uh, a variety of maladies, uh, and uh, what the reforms in the healthcare sector are seeking to do is bringing more private sector investment uh, and upgrading uh, facilities. In 2017 budget, the government allocated $32, point, uh, $32 billion for health and social development spending. By 2018, the kingdom is expected to account for 60 percent 
uh, of the entire uh, GCC healthcare market. And of course, new hospitals, as uh, listed here, uh, are being built uh, on an annual basis. So there's great opportunities for forming joint ventures, public-private partnerships, as the kingdom seeks to take more of the costs and assets off of the public books and into the private sector. And of course, uh, one of the challenges uh, that the kingdom is meeting by drawing attention uh, to both uh, business communities in the kingdom and the United States is getting capital, uh, not only foreign direct investment, but also domestic capital uh, into investments in this sector. So just uh, uh, a couple of notes on the U.S. engagement in this sector. The United States continues to be a valuable partner in Saudi Arabia's healthcare sector. Uh, the U.S.'s premier academic institutions, pharmaceutical manufacturers, healthcare providers, uh, they're all engaged uh, in uh, positioning themselves uh, within the country, and they're critical, of course, to the government's plan to uh, expand this sector. And uh, I have listed here a couple of uh, American companies that have already established themselves uh, within the market. GE, a longtime presence, pharmaceutical manufacturers, Pfizer and Merck, uh, as well as Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and, you know, I, I throw around big uh, names uh, within the U.S. Fortune 1000 community, but you have to understand that it's not just opportunities for large companies. Small and medium-sized companies can succeed in the Saudi market, and we see it every day uh, in the Business Council as we have uh, the majority of companies that come to us, uh, medium-sized companies in the United States seeking uh, market entry or expansion uh, in the Saudi market. So opportunities for the private sector – as uh, mentioned, uh, private hospitals uh, currently accounts for 30% of the nation's hospitals with 7% growth rate uh, between 2013 and 2015 that, were, that has been uh, experienced uh, with additional privatization underway. Private uh, health care centers, PHCs, which uh, number uh, the highest in terms of entities providing health care in Saudi Arabia, uh, the ministry has outlined plans to enhance, restructure, and rebrand PHCs along the lines of gaining public-private partnerships uh, to bolster their capacity, the number of beds, and the quality of care. Uh, and uh, some of the uh, opportunities specifically uh, I have listed here in radiology, laboratory sciences, uh, ph uh, pharmaceuticals, of course, um, on-site and off-site pharmacies, uh, expanded health care uh, as well, extended health care as well. Pharmaceuticals and medical devices, uh, it's, it is the largest market for pharmaceuticals and medical devices uh, in the GCC. Uh, the devices uh, market are about uh, valued at about $2 billion. Uh, they import uh, a, the grand majority of medical devices into the kingdom, although they are looking to manufacture those, uh, those instruments uh, inside the kingdom, uh, taking advantage, of course, in the plastics industry and uh, proximity to feedstocks. Market is growing by 10%. Pharmaceuticals, it is, as I said, the largest market there, and it is growing at a 9% annual rate. Historically, domestic manufacturing has been limited uh, to gloves and syringes uh, and medical furniture, they're looking to expand that, and as I had indicated earlier, you have a, a, a majority of uh, investment, uh, pharmaceutical uh, investment uh, and medical device investment uh, in Saudi Arabia, foreign direct investment coming from the United States. Uh, the government goal, uh, the government's goal is to increase the role of private sector manufacturing of medicines and medical appliances. Sixteen additional factories within the last year uh, have been licensed uh, and uh, dirt dug to, to uh, begin construction. Infrastructure. Saudi Arabia accounts for 40 percent of the Gulf's construction market. While construction sector has been limited in growth uh, in the past year and a half or so uh, because of a downturn and, of course, oil prices and slowing contract awards, the, the sector, we expect the sector uh, to see positive growth uh, next year and 2019. And, of course, ongoing mega projects provide opportunities
for international design firms and consultancy firms. Uh, and the infrastructure spending will benefit the government-issued uh, domestic and international capital markets uh, in terms of their, their debt offerings as well. 2017 budget allocates $13.9 billion for infrastructure and transport and $4 billion increase over 2016. Uh, and, of course, an effective transport network uh, is something that Saudi Arabia has and they're improving upon. Uh, but it will be needed to sustain the development, the kind of economic development, uh, to reach Vision 2030 goals. And I've touched on already the privatization targets of uh, some of the airports, uh, metro systems, uh, and uh, particularly on the service side uh, for the transport industry. How are U.S. corporations involved in infrastructure? Uh, Saudi spent uh, about $1 trillion during the past 10 years on construction projects. Construction companies comprise 27% of the total registered facilities uh, in the kingdom. So U.S. corporations like ACOM have been uh, in the country for years, doing a profitable business, Bechtel Corporation, Caterpillar, GE, and uh, Global Power Equipment Group uh, are all there uh, in the market. And so the, oops, the last sector that I'll cover, defense and security. So uh, Saudi Arabia is within the top five spenders of defense and security equipment uh, in the world. Uh, they spent a, a $63 billion on defense and security in 2016, including off-budget spending. Saudi Arabia is a major customer of U the U.S. foreign military sales a program, $110 billion in arms sales currently on the table, which includes tanks, fighter planes, combat ships, uh, precision-guided bombs uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, and also it includes $1.4 billion in military, military training. A lot of these deals were talked about during the President's visit uh, and have been talked about since. Uh, and, of course, the State Department, I believe, a week or so ago just approved those uh, part of that sale. Uh, Vision 2030 calls for 50 percent of the military equipment purchases from domestic suppliers instead of the current situation of importing these, these items. Uh, May tw 2017 saw the launch of a new uh, public investment fund-backed Saudi military industries uh, company. This is projected to contribute $3.7 billion to the GDP and provide over 40,000 jobs uh, by 2030. There we go. Established uh, U.S. defense companies have extensive collaboration with Saudi entities to support development of local defense industries. And so you see some examples here of Boeing uh, announcing um, uh, an MRO, uh, maintenance repair operation facility in Saudi Arabia. Lockheed Martin opened an in-country sensor maintenance facility in January of last year, and of course Raytheon is a long-term uh, market uh, uh, player uh, in Saudi Arabia. And so coming to the, uh, the last couple of slides, uh, I do want to highlight uh, small and medium-sized businesses. As I mentioned, you don't need to be uh, a Fortune 500 company to, uh, to do business in Saudi Arabia. And uh, I think at this point I'll unabashedly plug my new book. Uh, the, and it is called, it's published by Wiley called The Business and Entrepreneurship in Saudi Arabia. And it really is my homage to uh, the Saudi business community that I got to know during my few years in Saudi Arabia. And some of the, the uh, premier family owned businesses of Saudi Arabia opened their doors to me uh, and uh, for interviews and information. Uh, and as any of you know that do business in Saudi Arabia, uh, it's not completely closed, but uh, they are very insular in terms of the amount of information that they give about how they do business. So the book covers how the larger companies do business, but I dedicate a good portion of the book on small and medium-sized enterprises uh, with interviews of some of Saudi Arabia's uh, brightest minds. I mean, these, these uh, young Saudis, and not, they're not all young, uh, depending on how you define that. Uh, some, some of the folks uh, are in their 40s and 50s that uh, see entrepreneurship and starting their own business as a viable uh, career uh, and life pursuit. And so uh, when you look at SMEs, 
in 2016, SMEs comprised 90% of registered businesses and 60% of the total employment in Saudi Arabia. Vision 2030 uh, and the strategic areas outlined uh, in terms of improving the, the culture of entrepreneurship, increasing SMEs' contributions to the gross domestic product, the creation of new employment opportunities, and you can see here uh, how the distribution of the SME sector is, is broken out. There's a high percentage of construction. Uh, Saudi's going into that industry, commercial uh, and hotel industry, as well as industrial. The big challenge, in the, of course, in the construction industry and the complaint that you hear regularly over the last few years, how can I, as a young Saudi, break into a market that's dominated by larger companies? Uh, and there are, there are some cures there uh, that the Saudi government uh, has put in place uh, to help them meet those challenges, uh, not the least of which is the creation of an SME authority, very similar to our own uh, Small Business Administration. And the last slide, oh, okay, I lagged here, sorry about that. You see the percentages there. So this is uh, the last si slide. Uh, the government is committed to helping SMEs uh, survive and thrive in the, in the modern Saudi economy. Uh, they've created, uh, the Capital Markets Authority has created uh, NAMU, which is a separate uh, trading facility for uh, SMEs uh, within the kingdom to provide uh, help with capitalization. Uh, and uh, the construction industry, as I've mentioned, there are approximately 243 companies and institutions involved in that sector, of which 173 thousand are small companies, 54,000 are small companies, uh, 14,000 are medium-sized companies. And again, the challenge is getting a, a larger slice of the pie. Uh, and then trade. The majority of U.S. companies trading goods internationally are SMEs. A lot of people uh, don't know that. Ninety percent of goods exporters uh, and 97 percent of good importers uh, are SMEs. In terms of uh, dollar value, SMEs account for one third of U.S. goods and trade. And so, uh, finally, you know, the, the the U.S. Saudi Business Council is nearing completion on a report that we've done uh, with Accountability, a, a corporate governance uh, firm, consultancy in in New York. Uh, we'll publish a comprehensive report on the state of SMEs in Saudi Arabia. I mean, there have been a few, but we think ours is special because we've had a lot of buy-in from not only um, government entities, chambers of commerce, but also SMEs themselves uh, to tell their stories in terms of their challenges. And so um, uh, we look forward to, to uh, disseminating that report, and you'll, you'll hear a lot about it. But again, uh, I think the future, not only for large businesses, but Saudi uh, and U.S., small and medium-sized businesses and cross-border trade and investment is, uh, is high. Thank you for your attention. I want to thank all of our speakers for um, uh, keeping within that time limit there and uh, for providing us uh, for an extended uh, cerebral massage. <clears throat> the questions are as important, uh, certainly to people who are asking them, as the uh, narrative uh, presented uh, by these specialists there. And I ask that uh, I have uh, several, uh, uh, ten questions here already from uh, individuals. Please write your question on the, the three by five card that's presented to you. And um, it's best if you um, uh, use either a W uh, preface or an H. A W one is uh, uh, what needs to be done, who needs to do it, why does it need to be done? Uh, where will we be if we do it? Where will we be if we don't do it? Uh, why? Uh, and sometimes even weather, because if something's not broken, you're not supposed to try to, to fix it there. Uh, uh, these keep people awake at night, uh, policy makers, decision makers, administrators, and implementers, but the nightmare ones of the H questions, how. Uh, you cannot answer a how question with a yes or no 
and it usually entails some greater depth of analysis and assessment there. So uh, here are the questions. I'm going to read the ones I have so that you'll have your uh, mental acuity uh, sharpened a bit and the adrenaline uh, pumping, and I'll read them quickly and then come back to them because they, they don't necessarily have easy answers uh, or even difficult if any answers there. All right, and they're not, uh, I'm sort of grouping them together here. What are the uh, planned modifications to the immigration policies? What are the prospects, if any, for a tax treaty with the United States, which exists with some other countries? Uh, no real mention of uh, reforming the cultural entertainment market. Uh, specialists know that there have been efforts in this regard, and there's pushback by some of the more conservative elements of the society. Um, but what obstacles uh, exist in particular uh, to uh, reforming the kingdom's cultural entertainment uh, market, and how do the architects plan to navigate them? Uh, after the Arab Spring, Saudi Arabia and uh, other GC countries uh, didn't so much restructure their foreign policies, but certainly heightened the, the emphasis uh, on unity, stability, and responsibility, uh, especially with regard to sectarian ideologies and extremist uh, violence and, uh, and militancy there. That being the context, how do, uh, does one see or believe the severing of diplomatic ties with Qatar being likely to advance those strategic goals, which bear on the economic uh, objectives that all three of you have uh, presented and explained, described thus far. Um, several months ago, there was talk of th these countries, among others, being free riders uh, on the back of the United States' shoulders uh, with regard to uh, strategic uh, activism uh, in practical terms against ISIS, against al-Qaeda, and other extremist uh, groups. To what extent, if any, uh, do any of you believe that the opposite uh, case can be made in an argument uh, uh, be presented that the United States is in numerous ways a free rider in terms of what these countries, and Saudi Arabia in particular, have contributed to uh, regional security, stability, without which there can be no peace, and without which there can be no prospects for the prosperity that you have uh, outlined and addressed here. No one has mentioned how Saudi Arabia plans to increase the number, the position, and the role of women in the workforce. Uh, and how one can navigate the expected uh, uh, conservative pushback in this uh, uh, regard. And what measures, if any, have been taken to ensure each goal is met by the deadline? You mentioned there are two oversight um, uh, agencies <coughs> to monitor, surveil, and assess the government's strategy there, but um, how effective, uh, because this is quite new in and of itself, uh, can one envision uh, those two agencies or one of them or something else being effective there? Here's a controversial one that many people don't even go near. Uh, what do any of you make of the opaque finances of Saudi Arabia's ruling family? Uh, they are obviously enormously wealthy. Note the most recent purchase uh, by one prominent member of a $500 million yacht. And uh, Panama media uh, speaking and addressing other off-site contributions, masking um, the ownership by uh, prominent ruling family members of European homes and luxury uh, dwellings, uh, yachts, and elsewhere there. But their income source is mysterious. Does the emphasis on increased transparency uh, pose a threat uh, to their standing 
amongst the people they govern. If that's not a hot button one, what is? Um, will JASTA uh, becoming law, if it does become law, prevent the Aramco uh, international public offering from appearing on the United States Stock Exchange? Okay. Uh, some economists uh, would argue that privatization uh, drives uh, have a, an overall positive impact on uh, services for the majority of citizens in the United States and Great Britain. Uh, that's debatable. But uh, are Saudi Arabian leaders really helping the long-term economic health of the country in selling off public assets. Uh, public leaders are supposed to serve the public. Private sector leaders may give lip service to that, but uh, more interested in profits, or they're not. Uh, will the sales of these public institutions ultimately benefit low and middle class Saudi Arabian citizens? If so, how? Uh, and more than a rhetorical answer of yes, that will occur. Uh, Here's a more general one. What do you think will most likely determine whether the vision is successful or fails? Well, this asks for sort of a prioritization of the obstacles and the challenges. Uh, another one, how will the proposed green card system in Saudi Arabia, this has to do with the expatriates, the foreign labor force, the overseas contract workers, the third country nationals, they're sort of synonyms, uh, but they're non-citizens. Uh, I propose green card system in Saudi Arabia uh, impact the trajectory of the Saudi Arabian economy. And how, if at all, might it detract from the so-called Saudiization of the economy? Uh, it seems increasingly likely that the sources of Vision 2030 will require a certain degree of foreign investment. Uh, do you agree with this premise? And if so, how does the kingdom plan to attract such investors and to what sectors? Uh, perhaps you've addressed that already, uh, Ed, but if there's something else that you want to add or, or refine, feel free to do so. Uh, lastly, uh, this perhaps would be for you, Ed, one of the early stumbles of Vision 2030 was the Saudi Arabian government's freezing of payments to many private contractors, including U.S. companies. What assurances do you have that companies will be paid? And this will not be uh, repeated there. Um, two other ones here. You pointed out the growth in hospitals. You mentioned uh, Riyadh and Jeddah. Uh, there's commentary that Yes, health services are increasingly good at the local level and the national level, but what in, about the in-between areas and regional areas? There are many people who have need for dialysis, or cancer patients, et cetera, who need reg regular checkups, but they're not near a, a, a superb local facility, and they cannot necessarily make it to the national ones as such. Um, no one has mentioned about FIFA, FIFA in the 2022 uh, World Cup for soccer, uh, many believe that the would-be spectators are likely to be mainly Saudi Arabians. But having closed the land border to, to Qatar, how would this likely occur? Uh, would they be likely to go in boats to Doha there? Uh, lastly, with regard to internships, which were not mentioned, uh, this is something that a branch of the Saudi Arabian embassy has undertaken in recent years, and thus far some thousands of Saudi Arabians have obtained internships with American companies, both in kingdom and in the United States before returning to the kingdom. And the value uh, in both cases is that the travel uh, costs have already been assumed. Um, and this has been an increasingly successful, and yet it's insufficiently known amongst the American private sector. All right. 
uh, any of you want to raise your hand in terms of uh, one of these or more, just take one at a time that you uh, would like to respond to, all right? Uh, freezing of payments. Uh, Paul. I think I may take on one of the more difficult ones. <clears throat> After the Arab Spring and the emphasis on unity, was there unity during the Arab Spring? That's a big question. Uh, the Qatari situation has actually been in development since about 1995, if not before that. Uh, Qatar supported the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt during the first revolution and election, and they supported Morsi thereafter. The Saudis seem to be supporting a different group. There have been disagreements for a very long time on this. Same thing in Libya. Saudi takes one side, UAE takes one side, Bahrain takes one side, and then the Qataris take another side. And in Bahrain, the Bahraini leadership is convinced that the Qataris were involved in destabilization of their country. And some of the things that have been happening in eastern Saudi Arabia, the Saudis are convinced that the Qataris have been involved with that. Syria, the Saudis support one group, the Qataris support another group. And clearly the break point was the $1 billion ransom paid to certain groups in Iraq to release 26 members of the Qatari royal family. The Qataris also have Taliban collection people <laughs> in Doha. They are supporting Hamas, and they support the Muslim Brotherhood. Part of the meeting with uh, President Trump was to try to choke off the terrorist financing. And clearly, I and many of the people I work with agree with this. But if we're going to have a billion dollars landing in the pockets of certain people who are clearly terrorists and enemies of the Saudis, I don't think we're going to have a good relationship. And this situation with Qatar could go on for many years. And with the Turks getting involved with this and Iran getting involved with this, this thing could get into a hot war. This could get involved with the 2030 development. There is geopolitical risk out there that a lot of people are not thinking about clearly. This is a small area. It takes four minutes for a missile to go from Iran to Saudi Arabia. And the Iranians just sent missiles into Syria over Iraq. That wasn't just to send a signal to the Fahish, which around here they're called the ISIS. This was a message to Saudi Arabia and to Bahrain, and to the UAE. There are big problems out there, and we need to work with them to do this. The United States cannot solve this. It has to be a global solution. This could affect oil markets, LNG markets, many markets, and the entire stability of the region. The thing that makes me sad about this situation is this used to be one of the most peaceful parts of the Middle East, in quotes, relative. And now the instability is growing. Will this affect 2030? I hope not, but there's a chance it will. The Qataris aren't going to back down. The Saudis aren't going to back down. The UAE is not going to back down. Where do we go from here? I don't know. Um, Ed, would you like to take a whack at any of these? You want me to repeat some of them? Fahad, you would like me to repeat some of them? Uh, there's the women aspect that uh, uh, none of you have addressed uh, effectively. Uh, and there are several questions regarding uh, how to increase the position and role of women in the workforce and to counter the anticipated uh, pushback. And related to that is the uh, uh, green card impact on uh, Saudiization uh, goals for the economy. Could you please, both of you, or one of you, address that? So, so uh, you know, at the U.S.-Saudi Business Council, well, we are afforded the luxury of not having the comment on political questions, and there are quite a few here. Uh, <laughs> there were there were a few directly related business uh, questions, and just very quick thoughts on some of them. You know, the uh, in terms of the tax treaty, uh, I, I might have mentioned the largest gathering of CEOs and chairmen I've ever been uh, witness to, uh, besides the one that happened last month, was during the King's visit. Uh, I actually write about that in my book, and in that in that visit, and I talk about the the dialogue that went on between Saudi government officials and 
members of the U.S. and Saudi private sector. It was actually the former finance minister that brought up the point uh, that it's it's actually the Saudis that have been been chasing the U.S. government for a tax treaty, and that's based upon uh, the the U.S. business uh, community's desire to have one, uh, which places them at a uh, competitive disadvantage to uh, their European and Asian uh, competitors. So, you know, I we we fully trust the both governments to pursue not only that, but uh, 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 the uh, the bilateral investment treaty and others uh, that will uh, en enhance the competitiveness of, of U.S. companies. It was also uh, the question of privatization. Uh, is that really uh, meant to be a panacea? No, it's not. Uh, but public-private partnerships, along with privatization, uh, is a is a valid tool that's worked elsewhere. We think it'll it'll work in in the kingdom. Uh, the key uh, is, uh, you know, you have a lot of big Saudi family-owned businesses uh, in the kingdom that are global companies, uh, and so uh, convincing those Saudi companies to bring a lot of their capital back into the kingdom in partnership with foreign direct investment. Uh, will be critical to uh, to the success of uh, uh, the success of, uh, of Vision 2030. And then, just last one last comment uh, on the question of health care. You know, the, it's a valid point in terms of getting the quality of health care that are enjoyed in the three major cities in Saudi Arabia out uh, into uh, other provinces. Actually, uh, as a government priority, the decentralization of health care. Uh, predates Vision 2030. So the government uh, recognized the need to do that, and, and, ha and that's incorporated uh, in some of the restructuring plans for the healthcare sector, uh, and, and that is actually being addressed, and we have every confidence that uh, they'll, they'll succeed in that. Fine. Right. So on the um, question of, of uh, the issue of women, um, and, and again, I certainly wouldn't uh, dream uh, of saying that I speak on behalf of Saudi women. Um, I have an eight-year-old daughter, and something tells me she wouldn't want me to speak on her behalf either, but that's... Uh, um, <clears throat> but I think um, when it comes to the issue of women, I think that there's a number of misperceptions about uh, Saudi Arabia, and perhaps none more so severe than, than uh, those around the status of women. Um, unfortunately, I think in the West... Many look at the, the driving situation and think that's where the, the uh, conversation stops. Women do not drive in Saudi Arabia, and therefore nothing else is going on. Uh, their, their, their status has not advanced in any way, and that is simply not the case. As I already mentioned during my presentation, um, there are 30 women members of the Shura Council, and frankly some of whom have been the most active uh, and vocal in many ways, not just trying to advance issues that apply to women, but to Saudis in general. Uh, women ran for the first time in the municipal elections last year. Not only did they run, but about 20 of them uh, actually won their seats uh, all, all around the, uh, the kingdom. Um, over the past couple of weeks or a couple of months, a Saudi woman was named as the uh, chairman or chairperson, sorry, uh, no pun intended there, uh, of the uh, Saudi Stock Exchange, uh, another a uh, woman became the first uh, pre uh, president of a major Saudi bank. Um, so these are all very positive developments. I, again, I, I'm, I, find, I think it's very unfortunate for the issue of, of uh, the, the, you know, the, the driving issue to stifle the debate. I think that, um, you know, certainly I think gender equality in Saudi Arabia, as is the case, unfortunately, in every country in the world, uh, needs to, to advance. I don't think this is unique to Saudi Arabia, but there are many... There have been many positive developments. I think, as maybe it's already been mentioned, there are more Saudi women attending universities than men. Uh, a, a number of professions have opened up for them over the past couple of years, including, uh, you know, the legal profession and, and certainly in banking and businesses. And, and it's my understanding that there, there are at least two uh, Saudi women pilots, uh, commercial pilots, uh, in the kingdom, and possibly there's a class, I believe, that is being trained uh, now, and that, that number will increase going forward. Um, entertainment and culture. So uh, Saudi Arabia does have an institution, a new institution called the um, Entertainment Authority, National Entertainment Authority. General, yeah. Um, and that's a new institution, and it has 
uh, helped establish a number or uh, hold a number of events over the past year. Um, and again, this goes back to a point that I tried to emphasize during my presentation. Part and parcel or a central component of the vision is improving the quality of life for Saudis. So uh, I think there's an, a, a realization that Saudis, Saudi culture has to be celebrated, Saudi culture has to be celebrated, and Saudi history has to be celebrated. And uh, Saudi artists, uh, musicians have to be encouraged. I think you're beginning to see that uh, in a major way. Um, the, the authority has organized a number of events over the past year, um, uh, music events, art events, including, you know, featuring very young Saudi artists of both genders, uh, um, you know, Saudi uh, young children, uh, painters, um, uh, poetry reciters, and, and writers and others. Uh, I think that's very important. Again, it goes back to this, this uh, central theme of the vision, which is that, you know, going forward, uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia has to be a, a more inviting um, country for not just the Saudis, but for also, um, you know, foreigners that, and there's, the estimates vary, but there's some, probably a, a good eight to nine million non-Saudis living in the kingdom. And the quality of life, I think, it, it has to be more lucrative, more enticing for them to come uh, and work in Saudi Arabia. Um, and this also relates to the issue of immigration. Obviously, Saudi Arabia has implemented uh, various programs over the years that try to encourage uh, Saudis um, to, to play more of a role, especially in the private sector uh, by, you know, recent estimates as possibly as, as you know, private sector is still dominated by non-Saudis, maybe over 80 percent, and that's obviously, uh, again, not a sustainable model. There are incentives for companies to not only hire Saudis, but there's frankly some penalties for not hiring them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's still a work in progress, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, again, going back to the idea that there are all these um, stereotypes about Saudis, one of which is the notion that Saudi youth have this sense of entitlement. Um, you know, maybe that might have been the case years ago. That is no longer the case. I think that um, now you see Saudis doing many jobs, that uh, young Saudis, that maybe they didn't consider in the past. So one of the examples that I'd like to cite is uh, there's a, a – a, fairly, a very popular uh, fried chicken uh, franchise in Saudi Arabia called Al Um Now, years ago, many Saudis would have probably not been that eager to work in a, in a fast, food, uh, fast food establishment, and frankly, that's probably the case in the U.S. or anywhere else. But um, you are hearing more and more Saudi youth saying there's no shame in, an on, in making an honest living. If, you, if that's where you have to start, that's fine, that's experience, that's an honest living, and it, you build on from there. So when uh, the franchise finally moved from uh, my area, which is uh, Hejaz on the, on the west, to, um, to Al Qasim in the heartland of, of Saudi Arabia, not only was this a major happening and, and there were people lined up around the, uh, the block, um, <coughs> frankly, I, you know, it, it's good fried chicken, but uh, I'm not sure, you know, I, I quite get all the hype, but that's a different issue. Um, but what was also covered is that the, um, the staff at that establishment was all young Saudi men. Um, not only was that publicized, but the, these uh, young men were, were took, had their pictures taken uh, in a robe and gown, much that, that the way you see it at an at academic institution. So um, the notion that Saudi uh, young Saudis of both genders ha have this sense of entitlement, again, I think is one of the stereotypes that just – doesn't reflect the uh, realities of the kingdom today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have uh, refined uh, uh, previous questions and additional ones here. Uh, will the U.S. Overseas Private Investment Corporation come into this at all, and if so, how uh, to ensure uh, some of the United States companies that would be interested in, de in developing housing in the kingdom? Um, uh, looking ahead, does one see the prospects for a Saudi Arabian U.S. free trade agreement? Or if not that, then a trade and investment framework uh, agreement that will be uh, something more to enhance uh, confidence amongst uh, foreign investors? Uh, what are the prospects for that? And what about um, the competition in terms of uh, China, uh, India, and other uh, uh, countries whose manufacturing sectors are so low cost 
uh, as to compete with Saudi Arabia, is this likely to heighten the kingdom's protectionist regime in terms of uh, hard tariffs on uh, competitive uh, imports there? As uh, a question perhaps for you, Paul, uh, the extent to which Saudi Arabia can endure the decline in prices more than some of its oil-producing uh, competitors. And then in the financing sector, uh, what will be, if any, the focus on uh, Sharia compliance? Uh, here's one that perhaps uh, none of you uh, want to go near, uh, but what is the plan, if any, to deal with uh, potential significant social unrest that might develop as a result of the implementation of some of the 2030 plans? Should businesses or investors worry about that? Um, in that regard, uh, Ed, you were uh, good in distinguishing uh, security from defense. Uh, Westerners and Americans in particular use these terms and concepts interchangeably, whereas in Arab Arabic, they are completely different. Uh, security is uh, in the domestic realm, and defense has to do with external attacks, threats, or intimid intimidation. Uh, there has been extensive emphasis on both, uh, but the security component uh, would indicate that no one is asleep at the wheel or idling at the intersection in terms of anticipating uh, what could go wrong. And not to wait uh, to see if something unknown now or even unforeseen goes wrong uh, and then react. Uh, what uh, plans are there any uh, to uh, prevent uh, as well as react? I think those plans are in place and, and do not need uh, a significant uh, comment unless you wish uh, to make some and that businesses or investors uh, ought to uh, take heart uh, that due consideration has been taken uh, for this uh, kind of scenario, which has not occurred in the kingdom uh, for not just decades, uh, but generations. There's been far more social unrest in the United States uh, than, than Saudi Arabia, uh, even in, if the yardstick is that of a decade versus a year. Uh, any comment on uh, how... Uh, to counter or surmount or circumvent the privileged uh, merchant families that seem to uh, have a way of, of dominating the new opportunities in the economy and the, their resources and experience and leverage tends to be daunting uh, to the would-be new small and medium enterprise individual who's just out of business school or wants to go and try to make her or his uh, mark themselves. I don't think any of you have commented on the proposed green card system in Saudi Arabia and how that uh, might detract from the so-called Saudiization of the economy. And none uh, have uh, commented about how privatization is more complicated than a, the strategic conceptualization and articulation of the concept uh, would seem to imply. For more than a decade now, there's been talk of privatizing Saudi, the national airline. Uh, but alongside of it is, well, what would be done if it is privatized in terms of individuals thinking, well, it's too labor-heavy and that to make it profit profitable and therefore appealing to a private sector uh, investor, one would have to lay off or relocate or retrain those employees. N not an easy thing, or maybe even not a difficult thing uh, uh, to undertake. It's more than, than difficult uh, from the perspective of a planner. And then I don't think I've heard commentary on JASTA. Uh, explain what it is and um, how it might impact, if at all, uh, the Aramco International Public Offering from appearing on the United States uh, Stock Exchange. And then, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Sullivan's presentation included many ifs. Uh, and Mr. Burton's presentation uh, was a bit more uh, optimistic on the uh, numerous potential investment opportunities. 
Here's the question. What evidence is there to turn the ifs into whens and give more confidence thereby to potential investors? Um, I think these are great questions. Please uh, take any of them. Carl. Well, logically, if, if you're talking about the future, it is an if. You can't predict the future. There are going to be things that will happen. And I am uh, more optimistic than I usually am with regard to 2030 because of the help that the Saudis will get from the outside and also how they're moving forward with so many things all at once. The question about low oil prices and can the Saudis hold out. The Saudis can produce oil out of the ground for about $5 a barrel. Their break-even point is $5. In uh, the Permian Basin, it's 26 to 35. In North Dakota, it's about 50 to even 60. The issue with Saudi Arabia and many of the oil states in the Arab world and elsewhere is their break-even has nothing to do with the cost of getting oil out of the ground. It has to do with the cost of running the government. The break-even barrel price for Saudi Arabia two years ago was $108. It's now down to 70. That made an if to a when. That's moving things forward. And there were costs that had to be paid on that. I don't buy the argument that the price of oil will be low for a very long time. I've been looking at oil markets for a very long time. I've been getting the same question six or seven times. Sometimes when I get calls from uh, the press and others, I have notes from five years previous. Oh, the prices just went up. What's going to happen next? Just pull out the notes, say the same thing, put it down, hang it up. Oil prices are volatile. A lot of the reason that the oil price went down, the main reason is not Saudi Arabia. For the Americans in the room, let's get that straight. The main reason for the price decline in 2014 was oil out of shale reserves in the United States. We increased our oil production by 5 million barrels a day. The Iraqis were also increasing their oil production. UAE was. Venezuela is going down. It's a complicated market. But it was really the United States shale oil that did this, not the big bad Saudis as the newspapers presented to be. They need to take a look at the numbers. The Saudis increased after the price went down to get market share. It has nothing to do with the drop in price. Now, with regard to women, I know that has a disconnect from what I just said, but I've met some extremely impressive Saudi women along the way, including presidents of universities, PhDs. One of them, I had a long conversation with a PhD from Columbia. Uh, I gave a, a speech in Saudi Arabia a while back, and I met some of these impressive women in the green room and before the speech started, and I spoke with uh, the head of the auditorium. Where are these women going to sit? Oh, they're going to sit up there in, in the rafters. <laughs> I don't think so. I walk out on the stage, look out. There are the sheikhs, the ministers and all this, and on the left-hand side, right in the front, are the women I met. But things are changing in Saudi Arabia, and they're changing fairly rapidly, which should be a concern when you look beyond the elite and you look at the people who have, well, not progressive thoughts of movement in Saudi Arabia. But I could give the following example as a counter. Muhammad, the Islamic prophet's wife, hired him. He worked for her. What does that say about where things should be going in the future? I think that's a good exemplar. And also, the, the best students in Saudi Arabia, as I understand, are the girls. They actually graduate. They do well. <clears throat> they move forward, but the problem is once they graduate, what can they do? This is what 2030 is all about, in a way. They want to increase from 20% to 30%. For an American, that may seem, wow, what happened here? But let's look back in the history of our own country. World War I mm. was the breaking point in this country for women getting jobs. The men are at war. The women have to take care of the house. They learn about banking. They get the jobs. And then World War II made it even more so. Rosie the Riveter. And actually, some of the toughest generals I know, the households, the budget is run by the women. Let's not kid ourselves. A lot of societies consider themselves patriarchal. 
Whereas once you get into the private part of the house, it's exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. So things will change. Yes, uh, Ed, you want to take on some of, uh, there are about four or five that have not been addressed. And you don't want the audience to think that you guys are ducking these questions. <laughs> No, no, no. I, you know, there are a number of those. Uh, I think, in the interest of time, I'll just comment on the um, the bilateral agreements. You know, there's sort of a global trend now, um, particularly led by I think uh, the current administration here, to um, uh, to look at multilateral agreements uh, among nations as uh, as frameworks that may not be, in the long run, in the best interests of uh, local populations. Uh, and so when you look at the, uh, the exchange between the Saudi and U.S. governments over, I'd say, the last 12 years, uh, you, you have had, um, uh, I think, more of the momentum towards striking uh, a bilateral in investment treaty and, and uh, other bilateral frameworks between the two governments coming a lot from, from the Saudi side. Uh, and, and I think that is spurred on by the dialogue between U.S. business and the Saudi government and U.S. business and the U.S. government. Um, and knowing that the U.S. business community uh, is in uh, competitive disadvantages uh, with, with other trading nations, particularly China uh, and, and nations in Europe. So... Uh, you do have, of course, um, a dialogue going on at high levels. In fact, uh, there are TIFA, uh, I believe, uh, TIFA uh, uh, discussions going on or will go That's on. That's a trade and investment framework yes, agreement. Yes, exactly, yes. Uh, and, and so those continue to go on, um, but uh, and we have every hope that soon there will be uh, a bit in a, a bilateral investment treaty uh, or and coming out of TIFA. Um, and, and other bilateral agreements uh, that can carry forward uh, in a positive way the competitiveness of U.S. companies because, you know, China is, a, is an extreme competitor within the Saudi market, uh, and there are other European nations that, uh, that best the United States, and not many, but, but, but some industry sectors. And some of that is owing to the agreements that have been struck by the EU uh, with Saudi Arabia and, uh, uh, and China. With, with Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 